During World War II, there is one aircraft that is equally at home at 30,000 feet on a reconnaissance mission. As it is skimming at treetop level, taking the fight to the enemy's door. Capable of a 4,000 pound bomb load, it can smash its target with pinpoint accuracy. Or deliver a six pound shell against a U-boat. No one is safe from its fury. With a speed of over 400 miles per hour, it is so fast and maneuverable that the Germans award their pilots with two kills if they manage to shoot one down. Yet this aircraft was ridiculed from the start. In a revolutionary leap of design, it has no armor has only a pilot and navigator, and even more bizarre, it is built entirely of wood. But by the end of the war, nearly 8,000 of these aircraft had been built. It had won the hearts of all who had flown it, and had become a legend in its own lifetime. It was called the Mosquito. It was a thrill, absolute thrill, to be with those purring engines going and you touch the stick to the left, it went to the left. It was superb. It was just a sheer joy to fly around with these 1,200 horses neighing on each side. It was a thing of beauty and a joy forever, it really was. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations goes into harm's way with the deadly mosquito. The best aircraft have often also been the fastest. The pursuit of speed has been part of the appeal of aviation from its earliest days. And often it is the most innovative and radical designs that break speed records. The Lockheed Blackbird uses new metals that came out of the space race and flies at over three times the speed of sound. Throughout the 1930s, one company in Britain was also obsessed with speed, and it was one man's dream to use a radical material to build the fastest aircraft in the world. The material was wood, and his name was Geoffrey de Havilland. He was so very determined, I think he wanted to do, he got on with it and did it. A real leader of people, not by driving them, but leading them from the front. As early as the 1930s, de Havilland knew that lightweight wooden aircraft were the key to greater speeds. In 1934, his twin-engine Comet won the London to Melbourne Australia air race. With speeds of over 200 miles per hour, the aircraft flew halfway around the world in just 77 hours. A ship would take four weeks. From his experience of building the Comet, de Havilland began to have a vision of building a super-fast, high-precision bomber. De Havilland was convinced that with the rise of the German Luftwaffe in the mid-1930s and the terror they inflicted during the Spanish Civil War, Britain would need all the heavy-duty air power it could produce. It took the British quite a while to realize that the Germans had innovative designs, monoplane fighters, but more importantly, they had medium bombers that were being developed. And they had, in effect, tested them in the Spanish Civil War from 1936 onwards. It's a huge wake-up call. At the time, the British Air Ministry believed that the future of bombing was in huge, heavily armed conventional bombers, such as the Lancaster and Halifax. Radical new designs of lightweight aircraft were scoffed at. But Geoffrey de Havilland had other ideas and continued working on designs for his new bomber. His dream was to construct a cheap, easy to build aircraft powered by two Rolls Royce Merlin engines. Amazingly, it would have no guns, no armor plating, 
could carry up to 4,000 pounds of explosive and with a speed of nearly 400 miles per hour would be faster than any other aircraft in the world. But the most amazing concept of his vision was to build a warplane made entirely of wood. The aerodynamicists and the military men at the time ridiculed the idea, saying, how can you build a modern bomber out of wood? How would it carry bombs? And how would it protect itself? But de Havilland had all the answers. It wouldn't need to protect itself. Its defense would be speed. And as far as strength was concerned, pound for pound, timber has similar structural properties as aluminium and steel. There's a shortage uh, in Britain in the late 1930s of, of uh, metal workers, of people skilled in, in the new technologies of, of, of fighter aeroplanes, of bomber aeroplanes. What you did have, though, was a, a nation of cabinet builders, of woodworkers, of individual small craftsmen. But more importantly, you can actually mobilize all of these people uh, to build it, and you can make it, in effect, a cottage industry. September 1939. With war in Europe, de Havilland is at last given the green light to build a prototype aircraft. Immediately, the de Havilland design team went into overdrive. Led by Ronald Bishop, they moved into a 17th century manor house called Salisbury Hall. This remote house was chosen to keep the new aircraft away from prying enemy eyes. By October 1939, work had begun on building a mock-up aircraft in the manor's enormous kitchen, and a hangar disguised as a barn was constructed at the western side of the moat. We were working often periods of time, six and a half days a week, and at some periods from seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night. But they were racing against the clock. In the spring of 1940, Germany conquered France, and the British army was swept off the beaches of Dunkirk. With the Germans poised for invasion, Britain was fighting for its survival. Every effort was focused on holding back the Germans, and de Havilland's wonder plane seemed destined never to leave the drawing board. By June 1940, the German army had advanced to the shores of the English Channel and was preparing to invade Britain. In six months, the Nazis had conquered Poland, Norway, Denmark, Belgium and France. Britain was the only country left to face the onslaught of Nazi Germany. With Britain fighting for its life, priority was given to building only existing types of combat aircraft. Geoffrey de Havilland's radical new wooden bomber looked condemned to be scrapped. But de Havilland was not a man to take no for an answer. Sir Geoffrey's uh, words are, well, they may not want it now, but they will want it. <laughs> De Havilland persuaded the Air Ministry to let him continue as long as he did not use any of the vital materials required for the war effort. Throughout the summer of 1940, as Britain fought for survival against the German Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, de Havilland and his team worked on their wooden bomber. Finally, in December 1940, the aircraft was ready to be shown to the men from the Ministry. It would be called the Mosquito. De Havilland had done the impossible. Using scraps from the British military machine, he had created the fastest aircraft in the world. We, we knew it would fly. We were confident, absolutely confident it would. And the question is, uh, how much better than the Spitfire it would be? Of course, we said it would be. And it was. <laughs> 20 miles an hour faster. <laughs> The Air Ministry was so impressed with its performance that they placed an order for 150 mosquitoes. It was an amazing contract for an untried and untested aircraft. It's almost an impossible task. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing to change from, they don't want it, 
And so give us more and more. <laughs> but it was de Havilland's vision of construction that answered this call and enabled the mosquito to be built in vast numbers. A plan that was as simple in practice as it was visionary in conception. The aircraft was to be built like a model aircraft with wood, plywood, glue and screws. Over 400 companies around Britain with woodworking craftsmen would make the various sections. The fuselage would be made in two halves before being bonded together. The wing would be assembled in one piece and then transported to the main factory for the final assembly. In all, over six tons of wood and nearly 50,000 brass screws were used in each aircraft. At 40 feet long and with a wingspan of 54 feet, a legend had been born. With a speed of 400 miles per hour, faster than any aircraft in the world, the Mosquito was ready to do battle. The RAF viewed these aircraft as too valuable to let just anybody fly them. Only the most experienced crews were selected. But for many of these men, powered by its two mighty Merlin engines, the Mosquito was unlike anything they had ever flown before. The, the purr of a Merlin is something, something to experience, it really is. And then we taxied out and took off. There you were, you suddenly look at the uh, altimeter, the one minute you're down at a thousand feet, next minute you're up at 30,000. She would climb at 2,500 feet a minute and that was really going some. You had to get into a jet to fly anything faster than that. If you started to mishandle her, pushing and pulling, in no time at all you would over control and she would be like a mosquito, she would sting you. In July 1941, the first mosquitoes to go into service were delivered as photo reconnaissance units. It had taken only 22 months from the first drawings to delivery. Unarmed, bristling with up to five cameras, these aircraft were soon sweeping all over Europe, evading anti-aircraft guns and fighters. The Germans had nowhere to hide. Nothing was safe from the mosquitoes' prying eyes. Photo reconnaissance was vital. We're talking of the days before satellites, the days when human intelligence on the ground um, was, was limited. It was difficult to get back good information. Before every single bomber command raid over enemy targets, they had to take pictures of the targets and had to report the weather. Uh, as well. So the Mosquito was an ideal aeroplane for that. In fact, you could say probably it was the best aircraft for this. But it was as a bomber that the Mosquito came into its own. During the early part of World War II, bombing was a case of hit or miss. Aircraft flying at 16,000 feet would drop their bombs in huge numbers, trusting on flying skill, weather and luck to hit their targets. But by mid-1942, the Mosquito bomber version was going to change all that. Relying solely on speed and height to outrun the enemy fighters, Mosquitoes could drop their bombs with pinpoint accuracy. Soon, Mosquitoes with payloads of up to 4,000 pounds, equivalent to a B-17 bomber, were an integral part of bombing missions. But to make the Mosquito even more deadly, they perfected the art of fast, low-level daylight raids. We had to be under 50 feet to be under the radar. That's the whole point of low-level operations. So the Germans don't know you're coming. And then, of course, you had to go low over the target as possible, so that you took them hopefully by surprise. Some daylight raids were flown at such low altitudes that mosquitoes would often come back with strange souvenirs from their mission. Many a mozzie pilot's come back with telephone, or wires draped round his tail wheel. I know I've come back with branches of trees that weren't planted in England. Mosquito squadrons were now becoming more and more daring in their attacks, none more so than the daylight raid against the Dutch Philips radio factory in Eindhoven. 
Intelligence had discovered that the Germans were using the factory for research into radar countermeasures and had to be destroyed. The raid would bring yet another unusual role for the Mosquito and its pilot. They sent for me three days or four days before the raid and said, I've got a special job I want you to do. <laughs> We've got a cameraman coming up and I want you to uh, fly with him down the Scheldt estuary, uh, right down as far as Holland itself, and then turn round, come back, taking a film of the route, which we will all be taking to Eindhoven. On December the 6th, 1942, 10 mosquitoes went for their target. We went low level down the uh, Scheldt estuary into Holland. And then just then we were approaching a place I called Turnhout. And at that point we had to climb up to a thousand feet. And then we turned to port and uh, up came the factory and went down in a screaming dive and dropped our bombs straight into it. Racing for home, the mosquitoes were caught in German anti-aircraft fire, or flak. Over the North Sea, disaster struck. The chap who decided to follow me, because he, he was on his first trip and he thought he'd follow an experienced pilot, and I'm afraid he caught a bit of flak because he, my cameraman, suddenly called out looking backwards, uh, God, he's got, he'd gone into the sea. But I've turned round and went back to the sea. And there was no dinghy or anything, just a cauldron of boiling water. Just six weeks later, on January the 30th, 1943, the Mosquitoes went on another audacious raid, the 10th anniversary of Hitler's coming to power. Intelligence learned that there was to be a major Nazi rally in Berlin, led by Reich Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels and Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, which was to be broadcast on German radio. This was too good an opportunity to miss. The aim was not to hit the site of the rally, but to create chaos and interrupt the broadcast. With their speed and range, three mosquitoes hit Berlin at 11 a.m., interrupting Goering's broadcast. At 4 p.m., a second group hit, interrupting Goebbels. For the Allies, it was a major propaganda success. The Mosquito delivered to the Allies, particularly to the British, propaganda coups, um, right the way through its, its service history, and all done by a small wooden aeroplane that the Germans had written off in their propaganda um, as being some sort of antique. Later, Goering was heard to say, it makes me furious when I see the Mosquito. I turn green and yellow with envy. The British knocked together a beautiful wooden aircraft that every piano factory over there is building. They give it a speed which they have increased again. But if the Mosquitoes were spoiling Goering's day, the Allies knew that to spoil the Nazis' day, the Mosquitoes were going to have to bomb Berlin again and again until they smashed it into submission. Ever since it went into service, the 400 mile per hour wooden mosquito had been thrown into battle with devastating results. Whatever role it was asked to do, the mosquito answered the challenge, always ready to take the fight to Hitler's doorstep. By mid-1943, the mosquito was bombing Berlin on such a regular basis that the missions were known as the Berlin Express. But for the mosquito crews, nothing was ever just a routine mission. We would take off after the Lancasters, perhaps two hours after the Lancasters had gone. And it was at that time that I really felt lonely. It was a very lonely feeling. And it was at that point that you, you could start thinking 
about what you were doing. You had to rely entirely on the navigator who had radar aids and things like that. But then with the night closing in on you, and suddenly you suddenly began to realize that you'd left your homeland behind and, and you were heading for you, you knew not what. After two hours, the much faster mosquitoes caught up with the slow, lumbering Lancasters heading for Germany. Flying at 25,000 feet, the mosquito crews looked down on the procession of bombers 7,000 feet below them. And then you would probably be treated to a sight you would rather not see, which was the German night fighter force intercepting the Lancasters. I mean, it's true to say that once the German night fighters found the bomber stream, they didn't let go. And they'd be there, hammering away at the flanks of the heavies, and you'd see uh, a sheet of flame as a lank caught fire and then blew up. And this would uh, be the melancholy procession to the target and, and out of it too. It was just awful. But it was not only the night fighters that they had to get past. Like icy fingers of death, the German searchlights hunted for any Allied aircraft in the sky. The favorite thing for them to do was to pick up somebody with a searchlight and then fasten all other searchlights onto it. So it was like a moth in a candle flame and it wasn't very long before you saw brr, 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 one way tracer going and then an explosion as a Lank or a Halifax went down. Suddenly, the most frightful glare suddenly hit the cockpit and I was, this blinding light and uh, I realized what it was, but at the same time, this bloody tracer came shooting past. So I just dived and twisted and, and, and I got out of it. You could twist and turn if you wanted to, but generally speaking, they would hold you as you twisted and turned, follow you. Uh, the way to get out was to you know, dive, so you could do a screaming dive and quickly fly away. Eventually, the Mosquitoes and Lancasters made it to their target. Having dropped their bombs and taken photographs, they then had to fly back through the searchlights before they reached Britain. For those crews who made it back, the RAF found a way of protecting them from the horrors of war. People uh, came back shot up, and uh, one thing I did notice about the bomber airfields, of course, no one was ever sick. You never saw an injured man around the place. If people arrived wounded, he'd be quickly spirited away. Everybody next day was there, booted and spurred and smiling. Um, nobody was dead, or if they were dead, they weren't there anyway. One squadron did nearly 200 missions within a year and mosquitoes bombed Berlin 220 nights in a row. By early 1943, a bigger, badder version of the mosquito came into service, the fighter and night fighter mosquito. Now armed with 4.303 machine guns, it could lay down a devastating storm of fire. During early trials, it was found that the flash of the guns was so intense that it momentarily blinded the crews. Modifications overcame this, and because of the grouping of the guns in the nose, Mosquito pilots now had a terrific concentration of firepower. Soon these first night fighters were in action, and with their new radar guidance systems, were wreaking havoc on German bombers. The timing couldn't have been better. In June 1944, a new devastating weapon hit Britain. After D-Day, as the Allies were fighting to gain a foothold in Europe, Hitler unleashed his new terror weapon, the V-1 flying bomb. Flying at nearly 400 miles per hour, equal to the Mosquito's speed, and packed with high explosive, the V-1s were aimed at London. Once they exhausted their fuel, they crashed down on an unsuspecting target. Destroying these fast-flying bombs was a dangerous task. Quickly, Mosquito pilots devised ways to take these terror weapons out of the sky. 
They would uh, try and get some height and then swoop down on it and shoot it with cannon. But obliterating a terror weapon could be life-threatening in more ways than one, as one pilot was to find out. And he squirted at it with his cannon, but he was a bit too close and it flew to bits. And a bit of it came in through the front and uh, pierced the dinghy that he was sitting on. It inflated in the cockpit, so up he came off his seat and up towards the roof. But he, he was very fortunate. He carried, always carried a dagger down his boot. I don't know if he wanted to fight his way out of Germany, perhaps. He produced the dagger, stabbed the dinghy, and down it went, and he got home. Uh, when I heard the story, I was absolutely terrified, and I always carried a knife down my own boot after that, just in case. Whilst the fighters were attacking the V1s in the air, their photo recon brothers were scouring France and Belgium, hunting down their launch sites. As we got near the target, of course, the navigator would alert you to your position. Put your nose down onto the, uh, towards the ramp of the pillbox, uh, and the pilot would release the bombs. We did, I think, over 3,000 sorties against them. And in the end, Hitler only launched 5,000 of them. And it was an ideal target for the Mosquito. The Mosquito was uh, uh, made for V1 sites. After just nine weeks, the Mosquitoes had destroyed over 650 of these terror weapons. But the Germans were not beaten and were fighting as ferociously as ever. Once again, as the fighting intensified, the Mosquito would take its crews into harm's way and go down in history in one of the most daring and ingenious raids of World War II. From its early days, Coastal Command had used mosquitoes as a vital weapon against harbors, shipping, and vicious German U-boat packs. But by 1944, it had a bigger sting in its tail. Called the Tetsi Mosquito, this aircraft carried a Molin six-pound cannon with a kick like a mule. The rate of fire was about one every two seconds. Uh, you could fire it separately, and that's an automated one, one every two, or you fired it yourself, uh, carrying 24 rounds. Very formidable weapon. It was armor piercing. You uh, should have allowed yourself a range of uh, 1,000, 1,500 yards for the target but not to go closer than 600 yards. The reason why you shouldn't go in uh, less than 600 yards is because you, you, you might get a bit of shrapnel for your own gun coming off the, uh, the U-boat. Another weapon the aircraft carried were eight 60-pound rockets. When they unleashed these terrifying weapons, it was equivalent to a broadside from a light naval cruiser. Once on target, Nothing was safe from these fearsome mosquitoes. It seemed that there was nothing that the mosquitoes were not called on to try. Always ingenious, the military were constantly planning different ways to use this unique wooden aircraft against the enemy. But the deeds that made the mosquito a legend were the daring low-level precision raids against the German Gestapo. It was as if the Mosquito crews had declared a personal war against the hated Nazi secret police. From as early as 1940, the French resistance network had been a major thorn in the side of the German occupation. Its aim was to sabotage the Nazi war effort. By 1944, Hundreds of these resistance fighters had been imprisoned at the notorious Amiens prison in northern France, and word had reached the Allies that on February the 19th, 200 French men and women would be executed. An ingenious plan was hatched. Mosquitoes would be used to bomb the walls surrounding the prison so that the resistance fighters could escape. It was called Operation Jericho. 
The main prison layout was in the shape of a crucifix, surrounded by a 20-foot high wall, three feet thick and topped with broken glass. Located at the end of a long road, the prison was surrounded by open, flat countryside. The timing of the raid was vital. It had to be at midday when the prisoners were exercising in the yard and the guards were having lunch. Equally important was the placing of the bombs. Great care had to be taken so that enough explosive was used to smash a hole in the outside wall, but not so much as to kill all the inmates. When told of the danger, the resistance fighters replied they would rather die from RAF bombs than by a German firing squad. On the morning of the 18th of February, the Mosquito crews were told for the first time what their target was. We went into the briefing room around about half past nine, ten o'clock in the morning. And uh, on the table was a mock-up model of the army on prison. And we were told we were going to try and breach the walls and give the prisoners a chance to escape. The attack, timed for exactly 12 o'clock midday, consisted of three stages. One squadron was briefed to breach the walls, in other words, to toss the bombs or fly very low level and put the bombs at the base of the walls, if possible. The second squadron were to come in at two minutes past 12, when the guards had gone to lunch and bomb the dining hall, mess hall, anything they could lay their hands on to keep the guards under control in case of the first squadron not breaching the walls completely or the second squadron not doing the guards quarters etc then the third squadron would bomb the whole prison. As the crews waited for takeoff it appeared that the raid might be cancelled the weather had closed in and all aircraft were grounded. It was very, very bad weather, low cloud and uh, s uh, sort of uh, spitting snow, do you know what I mean? Very low cloud. And we didn't think it, it would go on. What the Mosquito crews did not know was that the French resistance had sent a coded message. Strike now or never, executions imminent. At the last possible moment, and with only two hours before the deadline, 18 mosquitoes armed with a 500-pound bomb load took off in conditions worse than most of the crews had ever encountered. We climbed through the cloud, and above the cloud we just joined up and went back down onto the, the uh, sea level across to France. Flying in two groups, and at almost zero feet, they swept across the English Channel. Amazingly, as they approached the French coast, the weather improved. It seemed that luck was on their side. When we got to France, it was covered in snow, of course, but it was clear, and we flew around and we picked up the road from Amiens to Albert. Long, straight road. And we settled down for the run in. In the fields around the prison, French resistance fighters anxiously searched the sky waiting for the mosquitoes to help their comrades escape. We could see the prison ahead. And we got down very, very low indeed. And we were coming down to around about oh, 190, 180 knots. With only minutes to go, and with the Germans completely unaware, the mosquitoes neared the prison. We opened our bomb doors about a mile from the prison, flying at about 10 to 15 feet and we had to pull up, go over the walls. We let our bombs go, and they went through the base of the wall. I turned to starboard, and as, as I looked down, I saw the startled face of the machine gunner in the little cupola on top of the prison. We looked at each other, I suppose, and then I was down onto the deck in loose formation following the wing commander. The raid was a success, and the Mosquitoes had pulled off an amazing feat of courage. 255 prisoners escaped, but 37 were killed, along with 50 German guards. 
The Gestapo were vicious in their revenge, and 260 prisoners were killed in reprisal. The raid was a wake-up call to the Germans. As far as I can see, this was a brilliant piece of precision bombing. The first flight took out the, uh, uh, the walls, blew in the doors, allowed people to escape. The second flight took the walls down. In fact, they didn't need the third flight. I think it was a startling success because it would have demonstrated to the Germans that the Royal Air Force could place bombs wherever they wanted to across occupied Europe. The Mosquitoes continued to carry out their unique style of war against the Germans. It was a period that would see them operating deep inside occupied Europe. Using technology that was years ahead of its time, they hunted down the Nazis. No one was beyond the reach of the Mosquito. Throughout the long and bloody conflict of World War II, the 400 mile per hour wooden Mosquito was always at the front of battle, always taking the fight to the enemy. But it was the Americans that came up with yet another novel use for this versatile aircraft. Late in 1944, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, a forerunner of the CIA, took over five Mosquitoes to work with their agents in occupied countries. Because the war was moving so rapidly, intelligence was having a hard time knowing exactly what the enemy was doing. Only agents behind enemy lines could supply this information. It was vital that these agents got this information back. Using Morse code was no good, as the Germans could easily detect it. Something else had to be found. Two American scientists had developed a transmitter that enabled an agent to talk to an aircraft. Called the Joan Eleanor system after one of the scientists' wives, it was an early version of the mobile phone. By transmitting on a wave band so narrow, the Germans could only detect the agent if they were within 50 feet of him. But the ingenious part of this plan was the Mosquito. With its speed and height, it could fly undetected along a predetermined 150 mile line, listening for the agent's message. Deep inside the Mosquito was an OSS operative. Within the fuselage, it was hardly enough room to move. And uh, I was sitting in on, almost on top of a big fuel tank. The petrol in there would expand and would come out on a special valve. And I could see it down there move, bubbling. And that was petrol. When you switched on your suit, you always expected spark, boom. But we were so high that there was very little oxygen in the air. When the Mosquito got to the area, the OSS operative would begin calling the agent. This is 5278, 5278, calling Z31, 31, 31, and then wait for him, say, yes, I'm here, and give me the answering code. Sometimes the Mosquito would fly along the designated route for hours on end before the agent answered. When you heard them, that it, it was, um, it was exciting. It was, look, I've got him, finally confirmed who he was, and uh, his short messages would be such and such a unit is there, and they're going west on highway number so-and-so, and it's two battalions or whatever it is, and uh, that was, and we could get it back in three, four hours. But many times the agent never answered. Sometimes they could not find a safe place in which to send their message. Sometimes no one ever knew. Well, when uh, time was up, the pilot knew just how much petrol we had, we'd turn around, go back. The Mosquito had for a long time been the weapon of choice as a pathfinder for the bombers. But as a low-level marker, it was second to none in helping annihilate the German war machine in France. To enable precision bombing and to reduce civilian casualties, the Mosquito would fly with the squadrons of heavy bombers. 
As they neared their drop zone, the bombers dropped flares which illuminated the sky and the mosquitoes dived down to identify their individual targets. So four of you were coming in and the rule was that the first one who saw it called tally-ho, just that. You then positioned yourself and dived on one end of the target. And when you judged that you were at the right position above the ground, which was probably at about a thousand feet, you were coming down at quite a speed after all, you pressed the button and away went four 500 pound markers. And down they went and made a great blob of red on the ground. You got the hell out of it. Only when the target was ringed in red marker bombs would the mosquito leader call up the oncoming bombers. But one of the mosquitoes' most demanding roles was that of interdiction, the cutting off of enemy supplies. Nowhere was this more graphically demonstrated than in the days leading up to and after June the 6th, 1944, D-Day. As Allied troops fought a bloody battle to gain a foothold in France, the mosquitoes hunted independently, seeking out enemy supply lines. Trains uh, we preferred to attack because uh, they were always carrying war, war material in it, or, or uh, reinforcements for the front. Sometimes you could attack a train going into a tunnel and you'd get the other end of the tunnel and wait for it <laughs> and shoot it up as it came out. Uh, it, it was fun, really, <laughs> uh, sh shooting up trains. During the month of June, Bomber Command flew over 15,000 raids in support of the Allied invasion forces and by the end of 1944 had helped drive the Germans back into their own country. Finally, on May the 2nd, 1945, two days after Hitler's suicide in Berlin, 126 mosquitoes took part in the last raid of the war in Europe. Their target? The German port of Kiel. Within two hours, the city was reduced to rubble, a grim legacy to the destructive power of the wooden wonder. The aircraft that had been seen as some sort of joke when first designed had grown of age. It had become one of the most feared and lethal killers of World War II. Over 7,700 had been built and over 40 different variations had served in all theatres of the war. To the men who had flown it, the Mosquito was second to none. It was a love affair and I thought, well, when I finished flying, that was it. I never flew an air, another aircraft again after the Mosquito, never. It's wrong, really, to say it was a legend because the legend suggests it, it wasn't real I and mean, the Mosquito was certainly reality. Um, but it, it was a lovely aircraft, beautiful aircraft to look at, marvellous aircraft to fly. Well, in many cases, it saved my life, but I mean... Um... I think the wooden wonder, it, 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 it's been used before, but I think the wooden wonder really sums it up. It was. 